Welcome everyone who's joining. I'm just gonna wait um, for more people to start coming in and then we'll get started. All right, people are all starting to pour in now. Go ahead and get started in just a minute. Um, today, welcome to our um, 14th monthly webinar now. Uh, we are excited to be hosting Diego and Sander today from Tiano and Ori Catapult. We have five attendees right now, but 20 are registered. So I'm just gonna give a couple more minutes for people to come in. For everyone who is participating today, if you have any questions throughout the talks, feel free to go ahead and put them in the chat. And at the end, we'll have time for them. Uh, so we'll go through any that have been put in the chat throughout the talks, and both the speakers can speak on them. All right, I don't want to uh, cut into our time too much. So we have six attendees now, so we can probably just um, kind of get into it if we want. Again, for everyone who's just joined, if you have any questions, feel free to put it in the chat throughout and we'll get to them at the end. Um, 
we have Diego and Sandra with us, and Diego from Aurora Catapult is going to be starting first. Um, Diego, if you want to take over. All right, thanks a lot. Let me share the screen in a minute. That's the one. Can you all see? Not yet. Not yet. Oh dear, one second. No. <laughs> no worries. Let me try again. Ah. There we uh, go. Yeah. Can you Let's see now? See. Yep. Perfect. Right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Diego Miguez. Going to present uh, about uh, we'll do a presentation about tidal noise uh, monitoring in a high energy environment. Uh, main outline. Uh, going to first start talking about uh, the ORI catapults and uh, MIS, which is the group uh, within the catapult of foreign based in Wales. Uh, then I'm going to talk about a project with no innovation and SAGE about tidal energy noise characterization. Uh, first, talking about the context, the experimental setup, uh, the measurements taken, the results and conclusions. Uh, and then I'm going to introduce the you can take the challenge workshop, uh, the challenge uh, we're doing, which is the challenge number three, uh, which is going to be about, about the North Atlantic uh, right whales. So I'm going to be a bit of context about it and talk about the database and, and the challenges, challenges we're posing. So first of all, uh, the offshore renewable energy uh, catapult, or catapult, we call it, uh, employs what well, we have uh, more, than three, more than 300 employees based in the UK. Uh, we are we have uh, eight uh, UK regional centres, including the one I'm based, which is in Pembroke Dock in Wales. Uh, we have three UK Academy uh, research hubs uh, based on uh, electrical infrastructure, blades, and powertrains for offshore wind turbines, and an international uh, research and innovation centre in China. Uh, so we are uh, the UK's uh, leading technology innovation and research centre for offshore renewable energy. Our main mission is to accelerate uh, the creation and growth of UK companies within uh, the offshore renewable energy sector. Uh, we have uh, unique facilities, uh, research and engineering capabilities. Uh, we bring together and we actually act as a bridge uh, between innovators, industry and academia. Uh, in charge of yeah, trying to accelerate uh, the creation and growth of uh, UK companies. Uh, our main objectives uh, to reduce cost and risks uh, in renewable technologies, growing the UK economic value and uh, enabling transition to a uh, low carbon economy. So within the, the catapult, I work for the Wales office, uh, which is also called MIS, which stands for the Marine Energy Engineering Center of Excellence uh, started out as a five-year project uh, based in Pebble Dock in the Bridge Innovation Center. Uh, we have collaborations with the local universities, uh, namely Swansea, Bangor, Cardiff, and Cardiff Metropolitan. Uh, we are funded by the wider uh, catapult, uh, WEFO, uh, City Deal, and the universities. Uh, we carry out innovation uh, projects uh, supporting Welsh-based or uh, Welsh companies with uh, with offices in Wales. Uh, there is no uh, financial contribution necessary uh, from the companies. Uh, we provide a friendly approach uh, to intellectual property, uh, but as long as uh, we must comply uh, with uh, stated rules. And we, as much as we can, promote sharing of knowledge and lessons learned in terms of uh, data sets or uh, processing or outcomes of the different projects. Uh, within MIS, um, the overall mission of MIS uh, within the environmental and marine energy projects is uh, developing uh, the next generation environmental monitoring techniques, making uh, serving cheaper, safer and quicker uh, by the use of uh, autonomous vessels or uncrewed uh, systems. Uh, the advanced uh, data analytics applications. Uh, one of our uh, most important uh, missions is reducing uh, consenting barriers on the development of uh, offshore renewable energy. Uh, 
with a better yeah environmental hands and we uh try uh, and push for environmental friendly designs and the co-location uh, whether combining different types of offshore energy or combining offshore energy with uh, enhancing or promoting local habitats uh, our key facilities and expertise are in environmental uh, we have uh, environmental monitoring uh, instrumentation uh, subsea uh, noise modeling software and we've got a miss boy which is smart boy as a big asset um, that is capable of uh, real-time recording of uh, different environmental and and it can be used with any kind of sensors in real time using the 4G network and the use of the meta sites as well. So uh, the particular project I'm talking about was a collaboration with uh, Nova Innovation uh, and support of SAGE for both uh, the measurements, the in-situ measurements and the, and the processing and modeling of the data. Uh, the main goal of the project is helping uh, towards reducing consenting times for tidal energy deployments. Uh, this was, uh, yeah, the, the measurements took place in Bloomall Sound, which is a quite dynamic environment on the Shetlands, and uh, in which uh, current speeds can go over seven knots. Uh, this was the first uh, tidal array. <clears throat> it was the first tidal array comprised of three uh, gear turbines in 2016. Uh, providing uh, the Shetland grid with clean and, and predictable electricity. Since then, in 2020, a fourth uh, direct drive uh, turbine, which was more efficient than the previous uh, gear ones, was installed. And after that, uh, early this year, the turbines number four, uh, number five and six, sorry, uh, were installed. So it's now with six tidal turbines. Is the is become the largest. Uh, turbine array in the world so far. Uh, turbines five and six as well are connected via a pioneering subsea hub, uh, which sends power to shore by uh, using a single export cable, which reduces costs and, and risks associated. Uh, so the main goal of the project was uh, taking in situ measurements uh, to characterize the noise for the tidal energy, energy turbines, uh, both individually or as an array, uh, assess uh, their impact on uh, marine life in the area, as well as uh, trying to predict and assess the, the impact of uh, of using these type of turbines uh, in potential other high energy locations. So um, on the left image, you can see the distribution of the turbines within Bloomville Sound. So turbines one, two, and three, which are the three in the bottom, are the the ones installed in 2016, the gear turbines. Turbines four, turbine four was installed in 2020, which is the one on the top left, and turbines uh, six and five were installed uh, earlier this year. Um, for, as you can see in the top right, uh, this was uh, uh, Sage uh, developed a novel uh, data collection method. Uh, in this, uh, the hydrophone was suspended uh, below a float that housed the high resolution uh, GNSS uh, logger working at 10 hertz. The float was tethered to a drifting work boat on a 30 meter long um, rope and was cabled to a data acquisition system on board capable of uh, monitoring the signals in real time. Uh, the advantages of this method over using independent uh, drift boys is that uh, the signal, uh, sorry, the data successful data collection can be verified in situ uh, in real time, as well as the signal gain uh, can be adjusted in case there's any clipping or saturation on the hydrophone, as well as uh, the gain can be as well um, increased when uh, when the, uh, the signal level is very low. Uh, this method allows uh, drift paths uh, to be monitored uh, whilst targeting different data collection zones. And as it was mentioned in the webinar last month, uh, by a very nice presentation by Ian Mech, uh, they mentioned the IEC 62600 uh, standard requirements uh, for characterizing tidal turbines. Uh, so basically, uh, it tells about uh, for level A characterization, it requires the sampling of uh, four zones surrounding, uh, surrounding the tidal turbines, namely 
upstream, downstream uh, port and starboard. Uh, these 25 or 25 meter uh, square polygons are offset from the setting of the turbines uh, by four times the longest dimension of the rotor, which in this case was uh, 34 meters. And these polygons were oriented uh, to the direction of the of the flow uh, for flood and ebb, meaning that port and starboard, if there wasn't, if there were no angles between ebb and flood, uh, port and starboard measurements would be opposite for both type of currents. So moving on to the actual measurements, uh, the measurement campaign you can see on the left. Uh, in green, you can see the traces. Uh, of the tether hydrophon, uh, recording the drifting, uh, the drift paths, both at ebb and, and flood, and targeting the 25 meter, 25 or 25 um, data collection zones as required by the standards. On the right, you can see examples of spectrograms uh, acquired. On the top right, uh, the three direct turbines uh, were uh, working. You can see. Uh, T6, T5, and T4, uh, respectively, in time. Uh, next to them, uh, you can see the distances, uh, which are the horizontal offsets uh, from the G uh, GNSS uh, receiver to the center of the turbine. So you can see we passed turbine 6 uh, by 28 meters, uh, turbine 5 by 3, and turbine 4 by 52, right at the end of the spectrogram. Uh, in there, you can see the acoustic signatures of the turbines. Uh, and as well as for, for the case of uh, turbine six and five, a bit of a mix in between both. So overlap on the acoustic signatures. On the bottom right image, uh, you can see the spectrogram of uh, when the only turbine six was on. And uh, halfway, a bit further than halfway, the turbine six was turned off. So you can see uh, acoustic signature of the of the tidal turbine as well as uh, the background noise afterwards. Um, so this raw data collected on the drift uh, was processed and used as an input together uh, for uh, some of the water acoustic modeling. Uh, this input was combined with uh, the bathymetry of the area and other measurements such as water temperature and salinity. Um, the, yeah, uh, for the underwater acoustic modeling, uh, DBC was used as the choice of, of software, and the most appropriate solvers uh, were found to be a normal mode uh, model for the lower frequencies below 500 hertz, together with um, an, an N log R uh, model for frequencies above that threshold. Um, as a result, on the left hand side, you can see the two plots of uh, the equivalent monopole. Uh, source level uh, levels, which are understood as the mean square sum pressure level at a distance of one meter for a hypothetical um, monopole source. So on the top left is the direct direct drive turbines, and the and the the top left sorry is the, the direct gear, whereas on the bottom left is the the gear sorry direct drive, and the bottom left is the gear turbines uh, turbines one, two, and three. Uh, these were working as between 75 and 100 percent of the maximum power output, and you can observe. Um, <laughs> sorry, uh, you can observe on the top left uh, that there was uh, an important content between uh, 20 25 kilohertz uh, of the direct drive uh, turbines. We believe that the source of that energy was the power, the power conditioning plant, which was located within the the superstructure. Uh, this dominant uh, sound, the highest frequencies, uh, was absent on the on the weird turbines on the on the bottom plot. Uh, however, the gear turbines have an important content in the lower in the lower frequencies, as well as a uh, harmonic series of tones uh, with a fundamental frequency of, of three kilohertz uh, were also observed. These are believed to be uh, caused by the rotation of the turbine blades and and associated mechanical parts. Uh, and as a result as well, on the right-hand side, you can see uh, a sound pressure level map of the tidal array area showing uh, the gear turbines on the bottom having a bigger spread due to probably uh, 
the lower frequency content or the high energy or higher energy observed than the lower frequencies compared to the three turbines on the top, which are the direct drive ones, uh, is um, surrounded, uh, the, the area in pink is the limiting, uh, the limits the area above 120 dBs uh, threshold, which is believed the threshold for uh, marine mammal disturbance. Uh, so moving on into the uh, main results and conclusions. So uh, Blumel, uh, Blumel Sound uh, proved to be a quite challenging site uh, for taking measurements due to the important currents and environmental uh, issues around the area, uh, including uh, an important uh, level of background noise. Uh, we've seen the, one of the challenges as well as the contributions of uh, of the different types of turbines where the whole array was working. So there's a bit of cross-contamination between uh, different types of turbines. Um, the underwater sound uh, from both direct drive and gear turbines was found um, unlikely to result in injury to marine mammals, according to South Ole uh, et al. in 2019, uh, the, threshold, the thresholds put in South Ole et al. Um, disturbance uh, may be possible, particularly at close ranges, uh, but the upside of that is uh, it could be an important factor for avoiding uh, the likelihood of uh, animal uh, collision with marine mammals and fishes. Um, the findings, uh, findings uh, of this project are going to be used for feedbacking and hopefully improving uh, the current standards for the uh, characterizing tidal turbines and um, further development uh, Further modeling is going to be developed uh, in house uh, at MIS at the Wales office, including uh, including the assessing the potential impact of these turbines in other sites. So moving on to that, I'm just going to finish by introducing the underwater uh, acoustic data challenge workshop, which is happening uh, next month near Bath in Gaia's house. We are presenting the third of the of the challenges, which is going to be about. Uh, uh, you, the use of uh, sonobuoy network for marine mammal tracking, uh, particularly in North Atlantic uh, right whales. Uh, we thank uh, from this uh, Canadian go uh, Canada government for allowing us to use the data set and also Sandra's group uh, in the Netherlands for helping out with the, with the data set. Um, so just to give a bit of context, uh, the North Atlantic uh, right whales is a fairly, it's a highly endangered species. It's been uh, defined as endangered uh, from the Canadian government since 2005 already, and since then the numbers uh, the numbers have decreased. Uh, the main uh, the main reasons for the decline on the on the numbers uh, are entanglements uh, in fishing gears, as well as uh, collisions or with uh, or vessel strikes. In 2020, it was believed that only 336 uh, spe uh, specimens were alive, and in 2021, only uh, there were only 90 breeding females. So it's a quite uh, a quite endangered uh, uh, species there. So we think and we believe that acoustics can play uh, a big role into locating uh, the North Atlantic right uh, North Atlantic right whales, um, managing uh, the impact of human activities around them. Uh, this is this database we're using for the challenge is the same that uh, that's going to be used for the DCLD 2024 workshop that's happening in Rotterdam next year. And the challenge mail is uh, the main uh, goal of the challenge is to uh, to use machine learning for detecting, uh, locating, and characterizing the the North Atlantic whale uh, right whales calls. Uh, just a bit of uh, further information about the data set. Uh, it consists of uh, the use of 32 sonoboys that follow a four by eight with arrangement, as you can see on the right images. Uh, it's a two day uh, deployment. Uh, the data comes from two day deployment that we've got worth of 3.5 hour data each one of the two days. The data has been uh, demultiplexed and stored in, in, in WAF format, uh, and it's been ordered between on night uh, sign and cosine, uh, sign being east west and cosine being north south, at a sampling rate of uh, eight kilohertz. The three challenges uh, we're posing for for the workshop are the basic 
uh, the basic goal of the challenge is to use machine learning to localize and identify identify individual whales using signals from one or more points. Uh, improved localizations could be implemented by detecting simultaneous calls in nearby boys. Uh, the intermediate challenge uh, consists of uh, tracking individual whales uh, throughout successive calls. Uh, this includes estimates of direction, uh, speed, and depth. And the most challenging uh, of the the, the most, yeah, the harder difficulty if we reach that would be um, to estimate the density of North Atlantic uh, right whales in the area during the survey time and being able to characterize uh, different types of calls. And with that, I finish my presentation and I'm going to pass to Sander, but happy to have, uh, answer any questions afterwards. Thank you, Diego. Uh, yeah, we'll pass it over to Sander. And just a reminder to all the attendees, if you have questions, feel free to pop them in the chat now and we will cover them at the end. Right. So my name is uh, uh, Sander van Mennebeckman. I work at uh, the Acoustics Sorna Department at TNO, which is an applied research organization in the Netherlands. Today, I want to talk about um, the impact of impulsive and continuous underwater sound on marine mammals. So just to provide a bit of background, as most of you uh, may be aware that sound is an important medium in water for animals to communicate, orient and find food. And almost all species can perceive sound on the water, as far as we know. I think a nice recent paper that kind of highlights the issue of underwater noise is uh, by Duarte et al in Science, where they basically discuss the changes uh, made in, uh, in the industrialized um, uh, time by humans, uh, where a lot of sound is being introduced into the water environment. And, that we, that we have, and then many of these sounds in many species are, are known to affect um, underwater life. So we have to think carefully about how we want to manage that um, uh, the future uh, to make sure that um, the underwater noise remains at the acceptable levels. And a lot of the research that I'm doing and also the, uh, we were doing at TNO in our department is aimed at um, uh, trying to tackle this problem. So when we, from our perspective at least, and um, the big five uh, noise sources in the ocean that we worry about most are uh, construction activities and uh, the development of offshore wind in the North Sea, uh, use of air guns for seismic surveys, uh, shipping underwater explosions, mainly due to clearance of um, uh, uh, old uh, UXOs, unexploded ordnance, and also active sonar used uh, during uh, to hunt for submarines by Navy sonars. So in my presentation, I briefly want to give four examples of the types of studies that, that uh, we're involved in, that basically address five of these, uh, these uh, big polluters. So first I want to briefly talk about the effects of underwater explosions on harbor porpoises. I'll be talking briefly about some studies we do about susceptibility of porpoise hearing to in intermittent sound. Um, some of the work we're doing to look at continuous active sonar on marine mammal behavior and also briefly about how we study the effects of ship sounds on animal, harbor porpoise behaviors. And we pick harbor porpoise because from a North Sea perspective, and at least in the Netherlands, it's a, a, a relevant uh, species of key concern. So we've done in the past, we've done some analysis or, or an assessment of what the potential impact is of clearance of UXOs on the North Sea. And these are typically being uh, cleared by detonation, so producing an underwater shock. And our initial assessment, um, where we combined locations, uh, the physics of uh, underwater explosions, also with distribution of uh, and presence of uh, animals and also their sensitivity to the sounds, we concluded that there was a large potential impact. So, with about 500 to 5,000 animals. Uh, um, getting hearing injury on, a, on an annual basis. And underlying this is um, 
uh, we used uh, um, shallow water uh, models for shallow water propagation of uh, um, explosions. We've been trying to, we've uh, had to do some empirical correction factors in the past where we had to correct the, the, the models to fit, make them fit to the, um, uh, to the data that we collected. So the more recent work that we're doing is try to better understand and more validate these models and to see whether the predicted impact is actually as big as we expected it to be. So what we currently do uh, looking into, and this is uh, ongoing work, is that we're trying to couple nonlinear models. In this case, we're using LS Dyna, which is a model that's often used for underwater shocks or also for car crashes and things like that. And we coupled, we uh, try to model the physics of the explosion. And we couple those to linear, you know, I would say typical uh, sound uh, propagation models, in this case, parabolic equation models to predict the far field signature of these shocks. So basically what you can see on the, on the bottom here is um, on the left is basically the outcome of, of the nonlinear uh, part of the model, which gives you a time trace for every depth that we model. And we can use that as a starter function for the pro uh, linear propagation models. So on the right in the middle panel here, you see the outcome of that model where we have the two, two uh, model aspects. So the Euler and the Euler PE. Uh, which gives us the far field signature, which uh, which is a deep water scenario, which we use to validate um, the model and the analytical uh, solutions that we get, which are kind of the classical uh, uh, models typically used to to do um, um, shock propagation. They align pretty pretty well on the on the. On our model predictions, we basically shows that we get the coupling right. And what is quite interesting, uh, we're excited about is that if you then compare this to the, the measurement, measurements at more at larger distances of uh, shocks that we carried out in 2010, is that we can actually get a quite good fit uh, to the data points. Um, and this is without any uh, correction factor that we had to introduce previously. So we're still working on this and we have to, there's a, a lot of questions that we still have to deal with about how, where we transition the nonlinear and linear uh, models, how we can push this to higher frequencies. So currently the computation time is quite extensive. The nonlinear part is typically, typically takes two weeks or so. Um, and we have to worry about um, the low frequency properties of, uh, of the geoacoustic properties of the seabed, which is, uh, a, a general problem for for any um, sound propagation modeling, also for shipping and air guns and pile driving. So the second example is, looks at susceptibility of porpoise hearing to intermittent sound. So generally noise guidelines are um, considered the impact of hearing, of sound on hearing of animals. And this is typically done based on measurements of temporary threshold shift. So this is our recoverable reduction in the hearing sensitivity after noise exposure. And generally, the assumption is that with the equal sound exposure, this leads to an equal risk. Uh, but there's some doubts whether this applies for different sounds of, uh, with different degrees of impulsiveness and also degrees of periods of silences uh, in, the, uh, in between there repeated or intermittent uh, sound exposures. So we've done carried out a, a study together with Ron Kasselein and Darlene Ketten, where we collected data of porpoises uh, exposed to a miniature air gun, uh, where we uh, could try to develop models to, do, uh, to predict the impact of, uh, of uh, repeated exposures to the, uh, to the animals for different conditions. So I want to highlight one of the outcome of these studies, uh, which has gained some attention, which is where we looked at the uh, use of kurtosis uh, on predicting risk uh, of hearing damage. And kurtosis is basically a measure of peak thickness of the, of the signal, and it's gained some traction also in uh, human literature for impact of uh, sound on human uh, humans. There are different ways how you can 
introduce that uh, or use that um, uh, the kurtosis uh, to correct the equal energy rule uh, to predict hearing uh, hearing effects. And on the right side shows an example by Zhao et al. in 2010, which basically shows that uh, if you correct, if you do not correct um, uh, for kurtosis, uh, you for different sound exposure with the same uh, sound exposure level, uh, you get a, a different uh, degree of uh, hearing impact on a population of uh, factory workers. Whereas if you correct that, you get a very similar um, uh, a risk. So we decided to try this out with our own, uh, to see whether this applies to marine mammals. And this shows you a set of uh, growth curves. So this is basically the amount of TTS uh, after exposures with the, a certain amount of sound exposure level or CL. Um, and we can apply different correction factors to this. So the first correction factor is basically that instead of using the sound exposure level, we use a frequency weighting. So we count for the hearing sensitivity of the animal, which is basically, which is shown on the top right. And this is basically the current standard used in many of the noise uh, impact criteria. And the different curves basically show you different types of sounds. So we have intermittent sonar sounds, which are more tonal. And we have uh, impulsive sounds like air guns and pile driving uh, playbacks. And what we show is that if you in include the kurtosis correction for these kind of exposures, um, you can actually get a better fit uh, or a more consistent growth over a wide range of exposure conditions. So I want to want you to focus on this middle right panel here, um, which basically has one of these uh, correction factors that ha have been proposed for humans, but then uh, where the parameter was tuned to fit to this uh, porpoise data. And this gives us a much more consistent growth curve over a wide range of uh, uh, exposure conditions. There are still some uh, caveats to think about. There's differences. I mean, the, the factor that we get is, seems to differ from that that is found for humans. Uh, but we have to consider that we're looking at different things. We're, here we're looking at low levels of temporary threshold shifts, whereas for humans, they, were, they actually looked at uh, hearing damage or PTS, permanent threshold shifts. Uh, we look at very relatively short duration exposures. Um, also porpoises have an adapted hearing system for high frequencies and also echolocating. And also this, the noise exposures here uh, were intermittent, for, uh, whereas uh, the human exposures were continuous noise with more impulsive sounds embedded in it. And also it's only uh, one animal for this, uh, for, uh, or a few, two animals for which this was tested. So it's a very limited data set. And we think before this is being applied, it should be uh, tested more widely. So my uh, third uh, example is where we looked, uh, we see this trend or consider this trend uh, that we see all over the field where there's a transition from pulsed high amplitude sounds to more continuous low amplitude sounds. And we see this in the field of active sonar for anti-submarine warfare, where this uh, uh, navies are considering using continuous active sonar uh, we see this in the field of air um, in seismic surveying, where instead of air guns, uh, industry is looking at fibro size, which is basically a very low frequency sonar uh, to look into the sea, uh, sea floor. And also for pile driving, we see that uh, there's a, uh, industry is also considering, in some cases, also already testing uh, or using vibratory piling instead of impact pile driving. So the question that we're asking here is, um, with, uh, do animals respond differently uh, to that sound? Initially, you can say, well, if the amplitude is lower, probably that leads to a lower disturbance uh, to the animals. Uh, and for this, we um, carried out a test uh, looking at uh, the, the, the contrast between continuous active sonar and pulse active sonar uh, between um, uh, on, on the, uh, the ability to, or, or uh, how much disturbance it would generate marine mammals. 
So for this, we we are part of a large consortium called the 3S uh, Consortium, which consists of uh, different partners. So, so St. Andrews University in in the in UK, um, FFI in Norway, and several other institutes. Um, and this is um, uh, which is a, a multi-phase project that a program that's been running since 2006, looking at the impact of uh, active sonar on marine mammals. And basically animals are being uh, is tagged so we so we can study the movement behavior of the animals and then we approach the animals um, uh, in a controlled way using uh, active sonar. So what was quite interesting is that we looked at, uh, in this case, we investigated sperm whale behavior. Um, and what, what we found is that uh, sperm whales tend to show a certain response to, uh, to high amplitude uh, sonar, um, which is shown here on the right, which is a panel, which is basically shows you a, a time budget in different colors for uh, different types of behaviors that the animals showed as measured on the D tags or on tags that were deployed on the animals. And this orange color basically shows uh, a behavioral state, um, which we call non-foraging active state, which is atypical, which we associate with the uh, animals being disturbed. So they don't show the general feeding pattern and resting pattern that they would usually have in this particular area up north in Northern Norway. And um, what we found actually is that um, the h -best, so these are, these are uh, high amplitude uh, pulse active sonar with the same energy transmitted as the continuous active sonar, show the similar um, amount of degree of disturbance, whereas the, the N-pass, which is basically the pulse active sonar with the same amplitude as the continuous active sonar, uh, showed a much reduced um, uh, amount of disturbance. So this basically shows that uh, that amplitude is not necessarily a good predictor, but uh, we, did, we had different uh, hypotheses that we tested and the, the one that best fit our, uh, our, 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 our measurements was that, that the sound exposure level over the, over the transmission was a better prediction uh, for behavioral disturbance. Uh, for this species, this uh, sonar. Of course, there remains a question, is this particular for only for sperm whales or does this also trans translate uh, uh, wider to other species? So I'm just going to skip my next slide. And uh, so we've looked at sperm whales now. Our current plans um, is to uh, look at the effects of continuous active sonar and also longer duration exposures in uh, in other species. So we're going to consider killer whales, which also have a higher, a larger overlap in the in the um, their vocalization range, and also very social species. Um, and they have overlap with uh, in, in frequency with the, the the sonar transmissions. So there might also be a different type of impact, for, uh, for instance, also due to uh, uh, masking potential. And uh, the next, uh, we, we, our, our next sea trials will start in October this year. So we're quite excited to see what will come out of that. So my final example is where we investigate, it's an ongoing project uh, where we investigate uh, effects of ship, ship sound on porpoises. And this is only a part of a much larger program, the Saturn program. Um, but I want to highlight highlight this part because it's it's quite interesting because we are really trying to approach it in a multi-stage approach where we go with uh, digital acoustic tags, so-called D-tags, uh, which gives you a, a very high resolution uh, view uh, but, uh, on the, the behavior of the animals, so the foraging behavior, um, so we can quantify the, uh, the, the amount of reduction in, in, in feeding, for instance, which will have, uh, could have uh, uh, impact the energy budget of the animals. And then in, in a separate, separate stage, we have satellite tag animals uh, where we look at um, more long-term uh, large-scale uh, movement patterns and relate those 
uh, to, uh, to uh, ship presence using AAS data. And we can actually quantify or predict the, 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 the ship level or the, the levels that the animals are exposed to using uh, some propagation models that we have developed in house. And we can also quantify the number of exposures. Now, all that information finally feeds into uh, the Deepons model, which is a model that looks at uh, population consequence of disturbance or PCOT, um, uh, which basically you, you can take the, the, uh, the, the observed responses and, uh, um, and, and, uh, and observe uh, baseline movement patterns of these animals uh, as they move through the environment and then uh, introduce ship, ships into, into the environment and see how that will affect uh, the energetics of the animals and ultimately whether that has an impact on the population. So this is a, a, a large collaboration also with a large of, uh, 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 which is being uh, led by Aros University. So I've listed a, a number of names here of people involved in that uh, part. So just to conclude, you know, I, I hope I've given you a bit, bit of impression of the types of work in, on, the, on the various aspects of underwater noise that we're uh, working on. There's still many open questions. So I think the main question at the moment is what is the consequence of the impact of these sounds on animals, on individuals and populations? There's still more derived questions. What are sensible sensitivity of animals to novel sound sources, which we haven't tested yet? Um, more insight into impact criteria for hearing damage, uh, the accumulation of exposure by multiple sound sources, uh, effectiveness of different uh, mitigation measures, um, acoustic models in our, uh, which is also one of our core expertise. Um, we do see that there's, they require further improvement and validation. Um, and I also believe that there's, you know, we need more uh, scale up of acoustic monitoring of sound and marine mammal presence and using PAM, for instance. All of this requires interdisciplinary approaches. We really try to work with experts in the field uh, from biology, ecology, computer science, and also with the stakeholders uh, to try to tackle these problems. So with that, I just want to make a, um, uh, uh, um, or point out to you two upcoming events. So one of them was already mentioned by Diego, which is the DCLDE workshop, uh, which I'm um, hosting in June 2024, which is uh, looking at um, uh, uh, more uh, monitoring, passive acoustic monitoring of marine mammals. And then uh, we also, uh, my colleague Franz Peter Lam is organizing the EZON conference in, um, in September next year which is we're looking more broadly about effects of sound on ocean and marine mammals. And also is aimed at bringing together science and policy and regulation. So with that, I want to thank you. And uh, yeah, let me know if there is any questions. Thank you very much for sharing, that's great. Um, if anyone has any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat now. Um, while you're working on that, I can just ask some questions that I noted. Uh, so I guess I'll start with Diego. I was wondering why you chose to use the blue mole sound. Um, and I feel like that would be a challenging environment with the complications of reverber reverberations and whatnot. So why there? Um, well, mainly it was uh, because it was what Nova was wanted to uh, to test, but it's a very, it's a unique site. It's, uh, is uh, the first array, uh, tidal array in the world. So it was a way, and it actually comprises two different technologies uh, for the turbines. So we're able to characterize the old, uh, the older version of the uh, gear turbines, and as well as the new direct drive, which are more efficient and uh, better performing in that sense. Uh, but yeah, uh, this it, well, it's a challenging site, but um, it's got uh, it's got its pros as well. So it's um, the water, the water there is really transparent. They've got uh, underwater cameras that have been collecting for years there, and the yeah, uh, the recordings are really really nice to to watch. Okay, good to know. And I have a question from the audience. 
They ask, generally, do you find a significant difference in sound propagation intensity drop off vertically through the water column versus horizontally? If either of you have an answer. Who, who was that addressed to? I mean, I, I can address it at least from my perspective and yeah. maybe Jago for- Go for it, Sandra. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, I guess the, the easy question is it, it depends. <laughs> In, um, it, it depends a lot on um, on the sound sweep profile and the bathymetry of your environment. So in, in general, if you look at the North Sea environment, which is very shallow and has a relatively mild changes in sound sweep profile over the year, you typically get a pretty uniform uh, distribution with maybe some kind of reduction close to the surface. Um, if you go to, for instance, to the Baltic environment, which has this very funky sound speed profiles, you can get a lot of, uh, you know, ducting, for instance, or channels, sound channels where the sound gets transmitted. So you get a lot more variability, where it can get significant variability between um, uh, between kind of different layers. Um, and yeah, in, in, if you go to kind of deep water, like a deep then, or a kilometer or more, then it, it uh, yeah, you, you also get more ducting at certain depths. So it really depends on the environment uh, that, you, that you're looking at. Perfect. Um, and another question, I was wondering with the damage to animal hearing that you're finding, is this, um, have there been studies about whether it is permanent damage that they're facing, whether after a certain time it um, like reverts and is healed and like with the behavior changes that they were talking about, um, like with the feeding, does that uh, stop after a certain point with exposure? Does it kind of, what does it look like long-term? So, in my first example, I was talking about underwater explosions, and those are you know, ex kind of extremely powerful uh, sound sources. Almost, you, in some aspects, you can't call them sound anymore because they're but it's just a shock wave. Um, and if animals are relatively close to that, so within maybe hundred or a couple of hundred meters, that can actually basically uh, uh, damage your uh, uh, your middle ear, uh, ear. so they basically re they basically get deaf and, and uh, so we know from some recent stranding events for instance in Germany there was a um, there was a mine clearance event uh, where several animals were stranded and they had uh, hemorrhaging around the ears and uh, damage uh, damage ear so we know I mean, we knew that from from theory, but I mean, this is showing that it's actually it it, it can happen. We actually we have plans and where we try to um, uh, compare stranding data uh, to to UXO clearance events to see whether there's any correlation in between uh, the, the two, uh, also more systematically over long year periods, because both both of them are monitored quite well in the Netherlands. So I think those kind of questions will hopefully tell us something more about how prevalent this this actual hearing damage uh, and, uh, and 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 just death of, of animals is due to these events. Lucky, I mean, I must say that also in the recent years, uh, uh, at least in the Netherlands, there has been changes in how um, also to try to deter animals away using acoustic deterrent devices. So that potential will also be, be, be uh, will be reduced. Great. Um, and for any participants, you can also put questions in the Q&A or the chat, either one works. Um, and then another question for when you were, um, you had mentioned that it was a small like population that you were testing with, I think it was with the porpoises and that there were only two of them. Um, so what kind of environment were you controlling in? How do you, was that in lab? Was that in the environment? Yeah, so this is done in a, in a lab setting. So this, so Ron Kasseline has a research facility where, um, where he has trained animals. So these are animals that cannot be, uh, be released into the wild anymore because they are uh, various reasons, but um, 
And these are animals are trained to do behavioral studies, basically. So you can do you can do hearing tests. Um, uh, just look at, uh, at swimming bioenergetics, swimming behavior, and uh, and also uh, these um, uh, sound exposure studies. So basically, the animals have to be trained in this case to do a hearing test, just like a human would be doing. So it's it's very training intense. So there's only there's not I think he's maybe one of the only labs that, that does that with uh, or one of the few labs I would say that does that with uh, with harbor porpoises. Does that come with limitations with how much you can test them for ethics and you know you don't yeah. want to expose them to anything damaging? Definitely. I mean these 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 tests are done over a very long period so animals have enough time to uh, to uh, to kind of recover and are not stressed and uh, things like that. Yeah. But of course, you know, if you look at these types of studies that have been done with humans, typically you look at populations of, of hundreds of individuals where you try to kind of average over. So in that sense, you know, if it's two or three or then it will be fairly, still be very, fair, fairly small numbers. Okay, great. Um, Diego, I was wondering, uh, with kind of on the same track with the blue mole ha sound, are you currently planning on expanding this to any other areas? Um, yes, uh, uh, hopefully, yeah. That's one of the uh, one of the end goals of uh, this kind of project as well is um, getting familiarized and trying to improve the methodology as well as. Uh, one of the ends of, of the model of the underwater acoustic model is uh, being able to actually predict the impact of uh, tidal turbines in in potential sites. So, checking with the hopefully uh, helping reducing consenting times from uh, local governments. Uh, uh, we were within the remit of uh, in my office within the remit of Wales and well, Welsh uh, Welsh coast. Uh, but yeah, that's uh, hopefully planning to. Take it some measurements, hopefully both before and after uh, planning installation of, of uh, tidal arrays. Great. And who are some of you mentioned talking or working on changing some of the current standards? So, do you have specific groups that you're working with on that? Or are you working on legislation? Kind of, what is your process? Like? Um, yes. Uh, well, so the people involved in the project are that are quite related to the. Uh, yeah, the people developing the I, the IEC standards. Uh, there's also groups for uh, uh, marine mammal collision risks, and uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's it's a broader uh, uh, it's a broader subject. Uh, we're trying to uh, provide some feedback to, but yeah, mainly the number one is the 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 standards for characterizing tidal turbines. Great. All right. Um, well, there are no other questions from, oh, the chat just came in. For Sander, uh, are there mitigation methods for unexploded ordnance disposal? How can these benefit marine mammals? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, that's uh, something that's currently in development and also changes a bit per country, how they deal with that. So in general, uh, what you can do easily is, is try to scare away the animals around uh, around the source uh, you know also introduces disturbance to the animals which is uh, but it kind of counterbalances the 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 kind of the the higher risk i would say uh, of, of just injuring them or damaging the, the animals so the, the other thing that people are doing in some countries like germany and i think partly also in the uk is to introduce bubble screens around it so this is also technology commonly used, for instance, for impact pile driving in, in several countries. It's a quite ex expensive and cumbersome process, uh, but you know it is known to reduce the, 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 the sound of impulsive sound uh, quite effectively, at least in shallow waters. Um, then what you see is a trend towards alternative um, clearance methods. Uh, for instance, using deflagration. I, I know that uh, Steve Robinson and, and uh, Paul Lepper and others uh, have been quite uh, involved in that. Um, so basically, where instead of blowing up the explosion, you, you try to burn it out. Uh, so you try to avoid getting the detonation. 
uh, and that substantially uh, you still get some noise from that, but it sub substantially re reduces the noise. Um, there's still a lot of practical issues that 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 you have to deal with. You know, if sometimes it uh, doesn't uh, go off completely. You have to deal with the debris. There's also other concerns about chemical pollution of the TNT that gets released in the, in, into the water. But this is, I think, most actively being pursued uh, this direction in the UK, as far as I am aware. Uh, I also know, for instance, with um, in Germany, they have a large program go coming up where they try to more clear, but it's more for, for uh, uh, mine dumps or basically dump sites where you have large amounts of UXOs uh, in one place where they try want to go clear it in a more commercial way. So they basically try to build factory, uh, a kind of a factory to uh, get get the UXO out of the water and clear it within the within the factory. But it's um, that's I think that's it's going to be mostly suitable for dump sites and not so much for because it's just going to be too costly for kind of individual UXOs you might find all over the North Sea. Okay, great. And I also now have a question for Diego from the audience. Um, what has been the reaction from commercial organizations to this data? Do you find they're open to adjusting their solution designs? Um, that's a good question, but within the remits of uh, tidal energy, yeah, well, this particular project hasn't been, uh, the outcomes hasn't, haven't been disseminated so much in the open. Uh, in the open world so far, we're hoping to to reach both commercial organisations and uh, and local governments as well. Uh, actually, uh, the good thing about the results we've got is that there is no uh, there is no that no uh, risks uh, of um, no hearing no no don't no injuries uh, to um, uh, sorry. There's no uh, it's only the disturbance. There's no injury to marine mammals. And hoping with that, helping local uh, authorities to be a bit less uh, demanding with the amount of soft times and 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 because there's a lot of uh, resources uh, from from developers that have to go towards uh, environmental impact assessments uh, before being able to deploy them and do the installations. So so far, with we've, we've uh, registered and the results we got. There are no issues uh, for marine mile uh, for marine life uh, nearby. So in that sense, it shouldn't imply uh, a modification from the developer in this case. But hopefully, with uh, gathering more data about different types of solutions for tidal arrays, yeah, we will hopefully um, feedback that back to the developers uh, to improve and reduce the the footprint of of, of the turbines. Yeah. All right, great. Well, thank you both for joining us today. Our time is about to be up anyway, so that fit perfectly. Um, yeah, thank you, Diego and Sandra, for joining us. Thank you for all the attendees for your great questions and your participation. And um, we will be sending out information about the next webinar soon. So let us know if you have any questions in the meantime and enjoy the rest of your weeks and your weekends. Thank you very much. Right. Bye -bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all.